tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It is with profound sadness and continued fear that I tell my story. I fear that I won't have long. And if you should chance upon my recording, and I hope that you do, I'll have explained enough that it may act as a warning to not engage in what we have and to leave immediately. We have made mistakes, terrible mistakes. My colleagues are now gone. Let me explain our journey while I remain able and alive to do so. I must be quick. I have little time left. My name is Dr. Michael Blackcroft. I'm a geophysicist from the University of California, Berkeley. Myself and 28 others, drilling crew, medics, geologists, two students volunteering as part of the program to author the proceedings for peer review, and a half dozen other necessary staff, engineers, technicians, some unnecessary academics, sent by stakeholders to observe, and a couple of cooks. Then, of course, our drilling team. The roustabouts, lead long operators, motormen, roughnecks, and other assorted drillers. I've been stationed here now for one and a half years. One of the final staff to join the expedition. It was early April. We were nearing the couple weeks left of light. When darkness would come... We didn't give up our project. It was contractual that we maintain our work on the borehole. We were positioned five kilometers off the Abbott Ice Shelf in the south. We lived in a series of prefabricated buildings with six small apartments in each. Small kitchen area that seated ten. The pantry and cooking area. An engineer room that held generators and other machinery. Two bathrooms that had one toilet and a stand-up shower storage shed in back. These domiciles had been around for about 30 years and they worked fine enough. There were a few other research outposts, currently unoccupied, scattered a few kilometers away north and east. The Lake Vostok research base was 125 kilometers away, owned by Russia to the northeast, and the UK's Emerson outpost to the east about 28 kilometers. It was always cold. It was minus 40 Celsius, the best of times in Antarctica, at this time of year. All of the doors were solid and windowless to keep out as much cold as possible. Wind chill brought it down to about 70 below. I always felt that once you hit 10 below, it didn't matter anymore. By then, you can't feel the cold anyway. The wind was the killer, but we had state-of-the-art thermal gear. We were pretty well taken care of. Our employer was wealthy enough. When I say employer, I mean the committee that represented the 75 million U.S. in funding received from multiple investors. We had been mobilized to complete the project that designed to retrieve significant samples from various levels beneath the earth. The Whitney borehole was started five years prior, drilling into the earth's mantle. The hole was approximately 20 meters in circumference, and the project was designated to continue until we reached 22 kilometers in depth. The glacier itself was a 4,000 meter ice sheet, so this was not calculated into the drill. Once this was achieved, a team would be lowered down into the hydraulic lift, positioned securely over the hole, down to the bottom, using a set of 4,500 lumen torches. The descent was expected to take approximately six hours, and once descent was executed, it would be communicated with the surface, and that's when the new drilling would begin on the floor of the borehole. The new drilling was the primary purpose of the expedition. The drilling would continue with a borehole expected to descend another 18 kilometers. This would be a narrower hole of one meter and take approximately two more years. More rapidly due to the narrowness of the secondary hole that would reach the Earth's mantle. We would then retrieve the core samples that we needed from the deepest hole ever attempted. 
The most ambitious drilling project in history would yield some of science's greatest finds. We could leave individually for two weeks at a time during the project, but not all at once. The drilling would need to continue, or Mother Nature would sew up the hole. The heat from below would begin to melt the ice slowly and fill the hole fast enough to become a problem. We reached our descent level of nearly 22 kilometers. We were proud of the jobs the contractors had accomplished. We then knew that this was the last chance for a few days off. There would be no danger in leaving the initial hole, but once we started drilling the secondary hole, it would need to be continuous. So we looked forward to the last few days of relaxation and being social. The landscape was desolate, white, cold, bitter, dead, for as far as the eye could see. Wind pushed the snow around, and that was the solitary movement across the plains of the Abbott Ice Shelf. The silence outside of the sound of wind was deafening. There was nothing. Not even penguins in this part of the pole. Some, more optimistic, would say that it was peaceful. I suppose that it was. This was a red-letter day for us. We had prepared the largest of the dining rooms located in Cabin 2 for a party. We would enjoy some decent food, break out the whiskey and wine that we had put away for the occasion in honor of the work we had accomplished and equally to enjoy the time, for we would have begun the most grueling part of the work. The cameras would be arriving in a couple of days for the monitoring, and until then we really could do nothing. So, we had ourselves a little party. Must be said that partying with scientists and academics is not exactly a shockwave event, but some really let their hair down when given the chance and enough spirits. It was around 8 p.m. when I got into bed. It had been dark already for a few hours. We had finished our last day of work before our small rest. I turned my lamp on, began reading my book. My wife had gifted it to me before I left. It was Ralph Ellison's The Invisible Man. No, not that one. It was an interesting story. of The author's journey during slavery to New York City. It was a million miles away from here, it seemed. By 9.30pm my eyelids were getting heavy, and with my last remaining consciousness, I removed my glasses, placed them on the side table, and drifted off. I'd woken at some point in the middle of the night. There was so much night out here that everywhere was in the middle of the night. I needed to pee. It was cold. I added my bathrobe to my pajamas to give me a little bit of warmth. The washroom was never a nice journey. It was shared so I had to leave my room for it and go into the hallway that was even colder. It had to be done. I opened my door to the dimness of a small nightlight and complete silence. Silence you couldn't imagine. It was almost heavy. I walked to the washroom. I did my business and I flushed. The toilets were nearly silent themselves, like a, like an airplane toilet. I washed my hands with ice-cold water, quickly and warmed them in a towel, and then rubbing them together until I could get back into bed. Walking back down the hall to my room, I felt something. It was nearly impossible to explain. I stopped and stood and listened and then slowly turned to look behind me. Nothing. An empty hallway. Cheap carpet, wood paneling, and a nightlight. A solid door at the other end. It was instantaneous, but I, I felt a compression in the air, like hit by a wave all around me of silent explosion a short distance away. I wondered if it was my imagination or the cold seizing me up, or perhaps an anomaly not yet experienced by us in this part of the world. Magnetic. Who knows? I then continued back to my room and got into bed and laid into my pillow, still thinking about that bit of force that I had experienced. I'm a scientist, and I'm well aware that everything has a fully rational explanation. At least, at some point, anything would eventually. I closed my eyes after a few minutes of looking at a glow-in-the-dark map of the constellations that I had placed on my ceiling. Suddenly seemed to be a collective groan from all around me. Some close, some far. I couldn't tell if it was coming from my cabin mates or my colleagues in the other cabins. Must have been. 
It added a more bizarre element to my recent and nearly evaporated mystery. Then some chatter beyond the walls. My teammates had seemed to awoken and conversed with each other. It didn't last long. Probably some of the night owls I couldn't sleep, meeting up in the kitchen for a glass of water. It ended immediately and remained silent. I got to sleep sometime after midnight, finally. That's what my watch had told me as I picked it up for a quick check. I fell asleep. This was the last, somewhat, normal evening. From here it got bad. I need to hurry now. I don't have much time. They're here. The day of the party, the team were in great spirits. I was not well rested, but a large pot of coffee in my sights was my salvation. I was, for the first time, able to take a nap later, so I didn't let my sleeplessness bother me. I sat at the morning breakfast table with my peers as we chatted about the forthcoming party and other things. <laughs> Which of you gents were up last night chatting away? I remarked with a little chuckle. Each of them looked at one another with a little smile, looked at me incredulously. Matthew, our electrician, and Arthur, our lab technician, were both notoriously light sleepers. They had both been awoken once by the sound of a faucet running down the hall in a closed washroom. They had mentioned that they slept soundly, as did the rest. They each proclaimed. All were asleep and hadn't left their beds. They were fatigued from an extra long day finishing the last drill phase. In fact, after a visit to the other cabins for a day off social visit, revealed that each and every project member had slept deeply, without disturbance, and oddly enough, without any memory of dreaming. They were all well rested and talked up a storm with one another about the latest baseball results and new films that they had requested from our overseas entertainment ordering supplier. So what did I hear? I know precisely that I heard a collective groan like a wheezing intake of air, and then chatter. Definitely multiple people, and it was distant but clear as day. I wasn't imagining this, and I wasn't asleep. I'd come directly from the washroom and I was wide awake, clear as day. Well, day when it isn't the South Pole so close to summer. I grabbed my bag and went out to the job site, alone. I wanted to make sure that I'd picked up all of my calibration tools. It was a ten minute skidoo ride, and with a clear day, it was a pleasure. I rarely got the chance to get out there alone. Of course, never since the final depth for the man descent was reached. I saw much of the equipment set across the ice, ready for assembly to create our hydraulic lift down to the bottom. It was all over the place, but I'm sure that the contractors and engineers knew how to piece this together. It was exciting. We were making history. I walked around the flagging that warned us of the whole edges and sought out my calibration tools and wiring that I had left out there. Seems just a few wires were left, and I reeled them in and put them into my bag and threw them onto the toe on the back of the skidoo. As I zipped it up, there came a sound. That same sound that I thought I heard the night before. A long inhale wheeze from below, in the hole. It sounded human or something. It must have been the earth settling or plates or glacier ice shifting, I thought. There is a chance, one that is most concerning, that we had ruptured a pocket of gas, methane, natural gas, or something. There have been many incidents, due to less extreme and shallower types of exploration of deepened valleys cut out by glaciers and then filled with loose aggregate rock, silt, and sand from digging, hiding freshwater reservoirs and natural gas deposits, but not from this type of precise borehole digging. The wheezing could be an exhale of primitive gas. Certainly nothing was alive down there. Nothing more than bacteria. I moved closer to the hole, on my hands and knees, ensuring that I was secure. Peered over the edge. Blackness. A strange rise in temperature. It was so much warmer than the freezing air around me. It immediately made me wonder if we were doing the right thing. Was it worth ripping open so much of the earth? 
venturing into unknown territory to discover new microscopic life existence that was ultimately a wider plan to understand the origins of the Earth. It all seemed unnecessary for that moment, while I knelt, peering. What if what we discovered was new virus embedded into the Earth? We would eventually expose our environment up here to the long-protected Earth mantle, 40 kilometers down. Well, as much as I was a leader on the team and a senior fellow of that particular institution that was partially funding the mission, I still felt that it was above my pay grade to consider anything beyond what I'd been activated to do. Just at that moment, from deep, deep down, I heard a, 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 a vague breath, like a blustery equine exhale, like a horse grunting. It froze me for a moment. I was beginning to run away from the idea of explaining this away as some earth movement or natural sound of the terraforma. I couldn't shake it. The one solace for me to consider that this was impossible. Another anomaly. Great. I pulled myself up from my knees and dusted the snow from my legs and stood for a moment longer at the hole, listening. Nothing. I walked towards my skidoo and made sure my stuff was secure, looked back briefly, and thought that I was glad that I wasn't going down there when they were ready. No way. I peeled off towards the compound to return to the preparations for the festivities. I was on decoration duty. It was no big deal. A few cut-up bits of construction paper designs on the wall of the dining area. Jed and Nora, our lab assistants, were stirring up the punch bowl. While Louise and Kimmy, our engineers, sat at the table putting together party tunes into a playlist. It was nice. Dr. Pimposa, our Italian geologist from the University of Turin, watched from the doorway, giving orders until asked to help with carrying some boxes of paper plates and food from the other cabins, and left. When I was finished, I walked out to ask Teddy and Nick if they needed any help cleaning. They admitted that they were nearly done, so I went for that much-needed nap. I gave a quick thumbs up to the crew before walking to exit the room when the entire cabin shook with a loud thud. Not an impact, but a potential earthquake. The punch had spilled over its side and Louise nearly fell off her seat. We were stunned. A group came over and asked if we felt it. Of course, we all did. The sound was as if a giant-sized, flat, palm had slapped the ground, the loud but muted bang mixed with the entire eruption of the cabin. We were all a bit shook up, in more ways than one. It didn't reoccur. We pass it off as a one-off earthquake, or perhaps, as I said, a burst of gas from a very old and sealed pocket. Earthquakes don't pop your eardrums, however. Our geologists were sincerely perplexed. This was not an earthquake for them. To be fair, I've experienced many initial shocking occurrences that were resolved quickly by academic explanation. Nothing was earth-shattering or uniquely mysterious. I wasn't concerned to the point of losing sleep, but if it were an earthquake-related event, we were sitting on a glacier. An ice sheet that was sitting on the earth 4,000 meters below us. Bizarre, really. If it were an earthquake... Strange to have given us this level of tremor so far below the ice sheet. It was loosely forgotten soon after. With our minds on the party ahead, we pressed on with laughs and preparation. I finally had my nap. I slept deeply and uninterrupted. It was needed. I woke around 5 p.m. and felt a bit groggy. I got up and got a shower and felt another tremor this time more intense. I rattled around in the shower and the water sputtered. I shut it off and tried to open the shower sliding door. It wouldn't open. I pulled and pulled. After 15 seconds or more, it slid open quickly like it was never stuck, which made me fall onto the bathroom floor. I picked myself up and grabbed a towel. I dried myself off to complete silence. The wind had picked up outside, but No laughs, no banter, no merrymaking, or shouts, not a giggle. 
I got dressed in my party clothes, which was jeans and a polo shirt covered by an old cardigan. This was as wild as it got for us middle-aged academics. I fixed myself up, cleaned my glasses and squared them onto my nose, constantly straining to listen for my colleagues. I'll be honest, it was unsettling. It was soon to become more unsettling. I put on my coats and boots, gloves and hat and shut the room door and walked outside to the party cabin. Nobody outside. Well, then again, there was no need. I spied our MI-8 AMT chopper sitting stoically and rested on the helipad across the open icy plain. One of the Haglund's rovers, our personnel carriers and a fleet of skidoos with trailers, two of the rovers were missing. I pushed over to the cabin and opened the door. Sorry, but where the hell was everyone? I was standing alone in the decorated kitchen, punch unattended, food cold on the counter and chairs perfectly in place. I walked throughout and each room was empty. Even if there was an emergency at the hole, that would never involve more than half of the existing team. I left and moved from cabin to cabin. At cabin five, I began shouting. Shouting inside, outside. No response. This was the most messed up practical joke, and to be honest, I wasn't really in the mood. I was now cold from walking from cabin to cabin. The inside of my nose was crystallized, and my eyes were starting to freeze, so I walked back to the primary cabin, the larger party cabin. I continued to shout to the rest. I warmed up, had some punch, munched on a chicken salad finger sandwich, and looked around, wondering where they had gone. Every transport was accounted for except two rovers. I knew that I had to take a ride out to the project site nonetheless. This was maddening. If it were a joke, it was the most elaborate I'd ever encountered. I grabbed the keys from the equipment locker and jumped into one of the rovers and went out to the project site. It was absolute insanity that I had to head a few kilometers out to a work site that was dormant after dark because of these clowns. I was more than a bit pissed off. Nearly 30 team members now disappeared. I suspect there was little gathering or ceremony near the borehole to kick off the party. A last minute thing, maybe. Maybe during my nap, the whiskey was tucked into and things got crazy. I was no more than a kilometer away when I saw a shape in the distance. No, multiple shapes. Across the windy landscape, blurred by blowing snow. I neared the group that I now knew were people. Clearly some of my team. It was Jed, Nora, our cook Teddy, and Eddie, one of the drilling engineers. They were walking towards me, towards the outpost away from the direction of the borehole. They flagged me down feverishly. They looked fatigued, certainly freezing. What the hell happened here? I wondered. I pulled up next to them. They pushed in quickly, shaking, hyperventilating. I asked them where the others were. They pleaded for me to get back to the cabin. Where are the others? Are, are they out here also? Why were you out here? Please, please go back. We need to get back. A fading Teddy asked. Hesitantly, I turned the rover around and started back to the cabins. They were in bad shape, labored breathing and convulsing in the back. I turned the heat up as much as I could, as much as was safe after the exposure to minus 40 Celsius. I didn't want them to experience shock with the temperature. We arrived back. They slowly exited and ran as fast as they were able to the closest cabin and slammed the door. I parked the rover and came in behind them. Nora was vomiting into the garbage bin. Teddy and the rest were slumped in chairs. Heads on the dining room table with blankets over themselves. Still shaking. They wouldn't speak. Not yet. I moved towards Teddy as the only one to have spoken so far to ask what happened. He looked at me with fear and shock on his face. When he spoke, it was with an incredulous tone. Like he himself was just coming to grips with something that he couldn't believe. Apparently the world changed during my nap and shower. The nightmare had spared me up to this point. He stood and walked me by my arm to another room. 
the pantry, peering over his shoulders at the others as to not upset them, with the discussion pending. He explained. Michael, it's unbelievable. He began. I don't understand. I'm so confused, Teddy. I took a nap, maybe two hours. I got a shower and everyone disappeared. I responded. Yes, yes. Let me finish. After you had left us, we continued decorating and preparing. We knew that the drilling team left with the snowmobiles to move the equipment away from the borehole. With the tremors we were getting, they didn't want to risk any collapse around the edge of the project. From the ice sheet cracking, they left. We then got an urgent distress call from them. It was not clear. It was distorted, gnarled, the transmission. We couldn't make out anything other than their screaming in despair. We didn't know what was happening. We took a group of ten of us to check it out. If there was a major equipment issue, or they were trapped under heavy machinery, we needed enough of a rescue team. I went out there with the first support run. When we arrived, the drillers were gone. There was no one there. We searched around the area, and then we heard screams coming from the hole. It was terrifying and confusing all at once. As we looked within, a vapor, a gas or steam started to fill up the hole. It was impossible to see anything below. Dr. Scully was perched over the hole. And it wasn't until I heard a muttered whimper come from him that I looked at him. His eyes were wide, in fear, but insanely wide open and the whites of his eyes had turned completely bloodshot, which was enough to immediately pull me away from this vapor. I ran back from the hole, and I saw Dr. Scully stand up, tearing at his face, pulling his hair out and screaming like a, like a lunatic. And then he leapt into the borehole. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was madness. Engineer Vargas began to do the same pulling her clothes off, tearing at her own skin, screaming, and then also leaping into the hole. I wanted to stop this as others began to do the same. My first instinct was to run. There was myself and Nora of the rescue group that didn't succumb to the insanity. We called in the situation to the rest of the cabin. That was a mistake. We only got a hiss and crackle on the transmission, unable to cancel our message. And when the others arrived, we were 200 meters or so back, staying clear of whatever it was that was causing this. And the rest didn't see us. They pulled up close to the hole. We tried to scream to them above the wind, but they were drawn to the screams from the borehole. We screamed our lungs out to try to advance to them, but we were afraid of catching whatever it was that infected the rest. We ran and stopped from fatigue. We spotted Jed and Eddie, silhouettes of motion in the storm running towards us, equally as tired and cold. They had also escaped, while the rest of their team had not. They explained that they experienced the same with team members, going crazy eyes bloodied, peeling away their skin, some leaping into the hole, but left at least five or six still there. I were last seen screaming towards Jed and Eddie and beginning to follow them. We don't know if they were still alive, Teddy added. Jesus Christ, they're all gone? I exclaimed. What was it? What caused this? Oh my God, they're all dead. I don't know. Most are gone. Eddie and Jed left some there that he said were following them. Maybe some more survived. It must have been a poisonous gas or something that caused hallucinogenic psychosis in them. I, I'm glad that I got out. We need to call for help. We need to get a rescue here. We need the group to help us, said Teddy. I don't know what any of this means, but I only know 
and we lost a lot of friends today. Today was meant to be a celebration, not a massacre. Teddy looked at me with tears in his eyes and walked away to join the others. I followed him and stood at the door, watching over them. They sobbed, collectively. I went to my room to get them more blankets. Then, heard a scream from outside the cabin. Multiple screams at different pitches. I ran to the door. At least six people were standing outside my clear view in the blowing snow, standing side by side. I shouted to them. Guys, it's me, Michael. Are you okay? What happened? Come inside. They stopped screaming the moment I opened the door and stared at me, almost fixated, nearly maniacal. They didn't budge. I peered at them. I squinted to see what I thought I was seeing. The wind calmed slightly, and enough for me to see that they were bloodied. Their eyes... Their eyes were almost black. Half their hair was missing. It was difficult to tell because of the amount of blood covering them, dripping into the snow. But it looked like they were naked, and pieces of flesh were removed. Again, this damned snow, I couldn't see clearly. Something was definitely wrong with them. They didn't move, only stared at me. A contemptuous but curious stare. The rest of the group inside, clearly shaken by this. I rushed to shut the door, but before I did, I moved my gaze back to the ghostly six before me. They had vanished. My brain cannot be screwing with me. Not this much. I rushed inside. I locked the door. And without a chopper pilot, we would have to make a move to the rover and get to one of the other outposts. Emerson was closest, but had no communications equipment and was unoccupied as per our last report. We would be deserted. We couldn't reach anyone an hour before, but needed to try again. I ran into the technician room, Teddy following me and attempted to transmit again. The radio was dead. Completely lifeless. Dead? We struggled to find the issue. Unplugged somewhere. A power issue. Generator was operating. We had accepted that we were locked in the cabin. In remote Antarctica. With no communication. And only a generator to keep us alive. While it lasted. Somebody must have cut the comms line. Either way, we had nothing. No radio. If we had no radio, we had no choice but to try to get out of here. Vostok was a long journey, but there was always a team there. Emerson had nothing, but we could try Lake Vostok Research Base. Those people outside. A shriek. We had no idea if we were in danger, but the five of us had to try to get to Vostok. I don't remember the fuel situation with the rover. The hangar was on the other side of the outpost. We would need to stop and get fuel to ensure that we could make it to Vostok Research Base. Fraught with near impossibility in the pitch dark, once we left the lighting of the base floodlights, we'd be on our own, traveling in a hopeful direction. We had no light other than the headlights on the rover to see ahead, to know what direction in a white, empty landscape filled with ridges and ice craters. This was a Hail Mary but it could be more dangerous to stay. Whoever those things were, whatever they were, they were no longer our colleagues. Anything human would have perished in that cold by now, not stalking us. Another boom outside, another tremor shaking the cabin, then screams tuning themselves to the quake. It was decided. We would travel to Lake Vostok. We could get help. Couldn't hope for our first message to have been received. We had no way of knowing. We raced around the cabin, grabbing everything we would need for the journey. A scream from Nora's room. We ran in. Nora was standing terrified, breathing heavily. She had seen someone. One of those bloodied things outside her window. 
peering from behind one of the other cabins. We calmed her and collected our stuff. Teddy suggested that he make a run for fuel, and that we wait for him to fuel up and he'd pull back around and we could jump in. He was the cook, but was often asked to do other jobs during the days in camp. He regularly refueled and cleaned the rovers. He could do this fast, under the cover of dark. We agreed, reluctantly. We waited as he moved towards the rovers. We watched him through the window. He stopped halfway and looked to his left, and then his right. We peered over to see what he was looking at. There were two of those things. Our former team, I'm sure. Damaged ghouls, standing about 150 meters away on his left and right, watching him. This encouraged him to pick up his pace and he got into the rover, started it, and set off towards the vehicle hangar fuel pump. He had disappeared into the haze of blowing snow. We could hear him stop in the distance. We waited, poised and ready to go. Figures in the distance materialized, somehow seemingly in control of the fog of flurry around them. As to never be fully clear in view, it was pitch dark, but the outpost light tower somehow illuminated the snow rather than the group. Standing side by side, again, Nora gasped. She told us that she believed that this was Dr. Hall and the rig operator Tim, with what looked like Engineer Boreen, three of them standing between us and Teddy's rover, or where it would be. Standing, staring again, not moving, somehow existing in this bitter cold. Instantly, and for the first time, they were animated. They screamed and ran towards us. This was terrifying and shocking. We shut the door and locked it as quickly as possible. We heard them slam into the door, trying to get in. The moaning from the front door mixed with screeching, inhuman and enraged. How were we going to get out? The lights flickered in the cabin. This sent Nora into hysterics. Jed was holding her and Eddie ran around the cabin to each room, checking the rest of the doors and windows. Christ, Teddy, how can we get to him? Is he safe? Where were the other three things? It was about 20 minutes later that we heard the rover coming back, horn blaring. We cautiously checked the windows for a safe run. We were terrified. We made a run for the rover. It was so dark. We moved outside and peered everywhere. The lights from the rover illuminated a wide area, and the space was covered in footsteps in the snow and blood everywhere trailing in paths along those footsteps. We jumped in and Teddy motored on. We had no compass, digital map, but we had a radio in the rover. We had no way of reaching Vostok because it was set to our outpost only, the primary comms room. We sent out an SOS. And as we left the base, we were so nervous to ensure that our last look was to guide us in the right direction. Because once we set out, there was no way of knowing where we were going. This was a terrible gamble. But we had bloodied ghouls stalking us, and if they were contaminated, or worse, Violent towards us, we would be in great danger. You guys okay? I said. Better now. Did someone bring anything to eat? Eddie said. I took a box of the nutrition bars. Nora said. God, what were those things? Are we going to talk about this? I saw one watching me pump gas. I had a shovel at the ready if I needed it, but it was ripped apart. It was messed up, possessed or something. Its eyes were pitch black. What happened to them? It was Kira, I'm pretty sure, but so hard to tell, said Teddy, peering through the window across an empty landscape, focusing on a straight path. Jesus Christ! I screamed. Look! I pointed ahead of us, just becoming visible in the headlights ahead. 
There were nearly a dozen of these things scattered, facing various directions. But as we approached, their heads slowly craned towards us. Teddy immediately accelerated away from them to avoid hitting them, which we were successful in doing, but now we were unsure about where we were going. We had veered into an unknown path in the dark, crawling across a glacier and trying to feel the direction which was useless. These beasts, bloody and haunted, some of them crazed, were our former colleagues, our team. Something had hit them to infect them from that borehole. We knew it was a gas of some kind that has infected their minds. They had torn themselves apart, peeled off their own skin for Christ's sake. We needed to avoid the same fate. We had a full tank of gas, some heat from the supercharged heater that barely made a dent but but better than the deathly cold outside. We just had to keep moving. I sat in the passenger seat, passing out, little by little. Jesus, we were all exhausted. Some slept but Teddy had to keep awake and then, soon, I would drive. We would have just barely enough to make it to Vostok. Should be able to see the halo of light from a good 60 kilometers away. And we just had the hope we caught it and traveled in that direction. Then, shit got worse. We were somehow, somehow, approaching the hole. The project drill site where this shit kicked off. How did we get here? We were traveling in the wrong direction. More of those things, four of them stood by the hole, watching us. Again, we accelerated away but had to make a 180 degree turn because we had been going in the wrong direction for a solid 40 minutes. This was going to eat into our fuel, which means that we had to ease up on the heater in order to make it. Those things were everywhere. Then a loud bang came from under the rover. Somehow, it seems we had run over a piece of equipment. It was now caught under the rover's carriage. This just goes from bad to worse. We looked around jumped out into the bitter cold and inspected. It was a massive drill bit attached to a hose. We had put all the shit away. How was it sitting in the middle of a damn glacier? We had teams move everything into a secure location. Now project debris scattered everywhere. We pulled at the hose, all of us tired and distraught, freezing and scared. Nora kept watch. We had a massive Phoenix utility flashlight that Nora used to scan around the rover. The moment the light left any point at that location, the rest would go ultra black. She was shaking. Scared. She wanted to be back home with her dad in Tampa, Florida. He was a cop, recently retired, and she wished he was there to keep her safe. Suddenly, low moans on the outer perimeter... It filled the silence when the team weren't grunting and pulling the drill bit out. It was nearly out. The large drill threads caught in the rover's large track. Best to have Teddy move forward to jog it loose. He got in and pushed forward a bit, raising up the rover slightly. Then, an organic screeching from all around the perimeter. Nora sprang the light frantically across the open area. Near the hole in the distance, a group of these things were marching towards them, coming into the light, and then proceeded to a sprint. Teddy moved over the drill enough for the guys to remove the tangled hose out of the tracks. It was too late for the group to get into the vehicle. Jed and Eddie were grabbed, while I pushed Nora in and I climbed in behind her. I reached for the boys, but they were yanked out of sight, screaming, pulled into the darkness. Go, go, go! Get out of here! I screamed. Nora was screaming and hysterical. We all were. We moved ahead, and as we shined the flashlight behind the rover, we saw there were at least four of those things running behind us. It was unimaginable that any living thing could exist in these polar temperatures. My God, it was enough to kill a human in hours even dressed appropriately. These things were out for a day now, mostly without clothes. 
and in some cases, skin, still running. Regardless of this perilous situation, it was impossible to try and wrap your head around this bizarre mystery. Something had afflicted these rotten things. It was most certainly something that we released from the project. We had drilled into the mantle for the first time in history. We knew about pockets of prehistoric gases and bacteria. We knew of viruses being released in the Arctic that were dormant for centuries. Climate change and melting permafrost soils that have been frozen for thousands of years. And as the soils melt, they release ancient viruses and bacteria that, having lain dormant, are springing back to life. The types of viruses are only known when they happen. We knew about anthrax-diseased reindeer buried under permafrost that were exposed after melts and then infected herds of them. That was just permafrost. This was something far deeper, far more sinister and game-changing. If this truly was a disease that caused madness, coupled with the ability to survive in a violent and ravenous state in the most impossible environments, it would need to remain isolated here. Governments would need to know. They would need to destroy this. At least coordinate and study it. Nora began scratching at her neck. She was drawing a bit of blood from the scratching. Nora, are you okay? I asked, concerned. She realized what she'd been doing and stopped. She apologized meekly, wiped her hand on her lap. We carried forward into the blackness. Those infected creatures stopped following us. We kept transmitting the SOS, trying to find any rescue. We took turns driving and kept going forward. Four hours or more now, driving. Nora slept. Teddy slept. Then, something in the distance ahead. Structures. Looked like an outpost. Random lights brightening isolated spots, but could definitely see buildings. This was optimistic. I woke the other two. Our excitement was increasing. Until... No. It can't be. How? We were back at Whitney Research Base. We were back at our base. Those are our cabins ahead of us. Where we had left hours before. He had been spun around a couple of times. We must have been circling back. We were distraught. It was inconceivable. We had just burned off most of our fuel going in a massive circle. We were past fatigue and overwrought with hopelessness. We stopped short of the base perimeter, staring ahead. The desolation of our abandoned home now returned. The last place we wanted to be. We had to gather ourselves, quickly come up with another plan. We wouldn't be safe here. We had only one solution. Only. We had to refill again and make another attempt. However, we had a chance to correct our last mistake. We could wait until morning. The sun had two weeks left until it disappeared beyond the horizon for six months. We had a couple hours of it soon, and it would give a good head start, at least. If they could not escape, the thought of six months of blackness would end them. They shuffled out of the rover, parked as close as possible, carefully entering a cabin, quietly, listening intently for any sounds. Movements, breathing, footsteps. It was quiet. We also wanted to be careful to not add any light that could be visible from outside, and they agreed to remain silent. They hugged one another for warmth with the blankets they could find. The generator was still operating, for now. There was some heat in the cabins, but it seemed worthless after the exposure that we had endured for the past few hours. Nora, I noticed, still scratching at her neck in her sleep. I was the last to sleep. We awoke. The sun was up. 
It was 10 a.m. We had a little less than three hours to make some distance. We packed up additional rations and blankets. Teddy refueled again, this time the last of the available fuel. That's when we heard it. Rotors. Choppers. Two helos descended into our compound. It was a miracle. They announced their presence and we burst open the door of the cabin, smiling. Utterly defeated, but smiling deep inside. They sat down. There were two crews inside each. We waved and ran towards them. Nora was placed inside one and covered in a thermal blanket. Teddy was driving back with the rover from refueling. Clearly he must have been as excited as we were. That's when we saw that he had a passenger. Crawling on top of the rover from its rear was one of these infected. It had jumped down to the front of the hood. We all saw it. The chopper crew saw it, and having no idea of the story that preceded it, had no idea what to make of this dried, blood-covered thing, with its skin partially peeled off, smashing at the front window of the rover. When it broke through, Teddy fought it off as much as he could and collided directly into one of the choppers as it exploded, the rotor flying off and into the rover, killing Teddy and that ghoul instantly. The pilot of the destroyed chopper must have been killed also in that fireball. Every living person involved in this drama screamed. The fire and explosion seemed to have alerted, or at least caused enough excitement in the stalking few creatures that had immediately shown themselves from outside the cabin. The pilots of Nora's chopper took off immediately with her in it. I was left at the cabin door, watching all of this insanity kick off. The remaining co-pilot of the destroyed chopper ran towards me at the cabin as I held the door open and screamed to him. He was set upon instantly with the hordes of beasts, and I slammed the door shut. I locked it and ran for safety. We were momentarily safe. We had been saved, and then we had been killed. Some of us already, and me remaining, waiting out my final moments. Whether they are savagely ripped from me, or slowly and painfully, from hunger, thirst, and the increasing cold. I've barricaded myself in the comms room. I've been silent now for what must be days since our rescue attempt. I had no food left, little water. The cold was unbearable. I'm losing focus, losing strength. The long dark would be coming soon. There are no more rescues. I have little battery left in my task cam right now. My recording will soon be over. I hope this is found. I hope that the world will know what happened and make sure this never gets to the mainland. Nora and her crew would have warned the appropriate authorities against making any immediate visit back. They would know to wait until the proper mobilization was planned. She knew enough about the situation. I was thankful that she was saved, that she would have brought back as much information as we knew. Sadly, she must have assumed that we had all perished. She would be back with her dad in Tampa, safe. I'm happy for her. Her dad would take care of her. I think about her violent scratching often. As I lay here in the dark, listening to my colleagues outside my door. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.